Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. We hear from pastors and business owners in Lethbridge who react to the province's open for summer plans. Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau got into a heated exchange recently. We will explain why. And we see firsthand the powerful work Samaritan's Purse is doing to help provide food for the needy in Africa. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. An Alberta infectious disease specialist says she has some concerns about the province's three-stage reopening plan. Dr. Lenora Saxinger from the University of Alberta says there's little data to draw from on potential effects of resuming large public gatherings. She also points out that vaccination uptake in the province is patchy. Her comments come after Premier Kenny announced that the reopening plan is dependent on COVID-19 vaccination benchmarks and lower hospitalization rates. It calls for places of worship to go back to 15% capacity as of Friday. Also, hair salons and restaurant patios to reopen on Tuesday and all orders to be scrapped in time for the Calgary Stampede in July. Our legislative reporter Tyler Dawson says NDP leader Rachel Notley also has some concerns about Premier Kenny's open for summer rollout plans. This was going to be moving too fast that it might put us at risk of a fourth wave. Now, the government, of course, responding by saying that, look, we've looked at the data in other countries in Israel, the United Kingdom. Uh, this is based on the science and things like that. So, so it, it is a faster opening plan, I think it's fair to say, than other provinces. Um, but the government seems pretty, uh, pretty sure they've got the science right on this one. Tyler will also have more details as to why government officials are concerned with Alberta universities having ties with a Chinese communist government. That Q&A is coming up after business news. Alberta's NDP is introducing a new private member's bill they say would prevent the government from selling or delisting provincial parks without first consulting with Albertans. Bill 218 says the government cannot reduce the size of a provincial park or remove them from the park system without full public consultation and approval from the legislature. The bill says the government would have to engage with Albertans for at least 60 days and pass a resolution by the legislature to implement the change. Alberta health officials say close to 214,000 Albertans have now recovered from COVID-19, including 11,515 here in the South Zone. There are currently 591 active cases here in the South. Across the province, there are just over 10,000 active novel coronavirus cases. As for vaccinations, more than 2.6 million doses have now been administered in Alberta, including close to 364,000 who've been fully vaccinated. While many restrictions are being eased next week, the church is getting an early blessing. As of Friday, as we mentioned, places of worship will be allowed to house congregants of up to 15% of their fire code capacity. Local pastors say that the reopening is a sign that God is up to something. We're really excited that there's progress happening, that there, we can see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. We've all been moving through, but we're confident God is up to something good. And out of all of this, there'll be great fruit. We'll see the, 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 the work of the kingdom advance in great ways. People need church more than ever, not just the gathering on Sunday, but is people at work in the world. This is huge. This is what we've been praying for. And we're, we're just, if there's anything, we're just thankful. Uh, thankful that uh, God is allowing us to uh, beginning to open up worship again. Restaurants in our city are now allowed to reopen their outdoor patios for business on June 1st. This means a lot of work for local business owners, but most are thrilled and ready to go. We were really excited to know that we can actually open again uh, for patio and takeout service uh, next Tuesday. Um, we're scrambling, trying to get all our food ordered, liquor order, and staff rehired, and uh, you know, see so who's coming back to us. But in, it's even more ecstatic that uh, we're hoping that all restrictions will, if everybody gets vaccinated and, and it lifts the end of June, it'll be dream come true for our small business people. So it's really, really exciting. It's so great because it's difficult. It's not the same when the clients come here and take the food and go to take out. So it's different. The, 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 the customers want to stay here, feel the Mexican uh, style or culture, and they are so happy when the environment is very good outside. So it's a great opportunity for us now to restart again everything. Only four people per table will be allowed on patios at restaurants. Pivot 
It's a word business owners have heard over and over again when it comes to provincial health restrictions, especially gym owners. Perfect Fit for You in Lethbridge will launch its third virtual transformation challenge since the pandemic began. Not only is the challenge at capacity, it's garnered interest from all over Canada. Co-owner Ashlyn Gunderson says the changes her business has made during the shutdown haven't been all doom and gloom. COVID has kind of paved the way and opened the door for us to expand our business. So we're not one of those fitness facilities saying our doors are closed, we're just sitting here waiting. Our doors are open virtually, which has allowed us to actually grow as a business and expand probably in a push in a, uh, like it pushed us in a direction that we wouldn't have taken otherwise. Now workshops that used to be hosted in person, you know, at six or seven o'clock at night, that didn't work for a lot of people for a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday workshop in town, in person. Now everything's recorded. We have things being able to be downloaded. We have people and speakers that now aren't just from Lethbridge because they can't be there in person. We have speakers that are all across Western Canada. So now we've opened the door also to collaborating with other businesses that aren't just local as well, which again grows and expands our business. Virtual programs can be found at perfectfitforyou.ca. As part of Premier Kenny's announcement about opening the economy, application deadline for the spring 2021 payment from Alberta's small and medium enterprise relaunch grant has been extended. The application intake, which opened in late April, has been extended until June the 30th. Businesses that have been affected by public health measures and restrictions are encouraged to apply. Trevor Lewington, who's the CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge, explains why the grant extension is so necessary. There's no question that businesses that were forced to close in May, for example, have likely seen a drop in revenues, probably having difficulties making rent or paying some of their overhead costs. And that's really what this grant is for, is to recognize that uh, many people have had to close their doors through no fault of their own other than to comply with provincial health requirements. And so the government's trying to make these funds available to help soften the blow and help businesses get back on their feet and ready to relaunch as uh, those restrictions are expected to end in the next couple of weeks. The Alberta government's budget cuts for universities and colleges has been a very tough pill to swallow for both the University of Lethbridge and Lethbridge College. According to the budget, post-secondaries in our province are expected to lose around 750 full-time jobs in the 2021-2022 school year. Cindy Voss, the CEO of the Lethbridge Chamber of Commerce, says typically the University of Lethbridge attracts around 600 students per year across 70 countries and there needs to be new ways to bring in students due to the cuts. One thing that, I, that, I, that I'm hoping to see um, and... I know the university has partnered with other universities and, and, and doing exchange programs. So, for example, my, um, my son is, is looking at going to the Netherlands next year um, to possibly uh, do a semester there. So using, you know, maybe using our, our, our local students and some of those international partnerships and programs that we have, with the other universities, that might be a way to showcase attracting people to come our way as well. In the current school year, 49% of operating expenses will have to be paid for by post-secondaries. The Alberta government's Open for Summer plan brings exciting news for local baseball fans. The Western Canadian Baseball League will go ahead with its first ever all-Canadian roster, and the Lethbridge Bulls have made an announcement that the adjusted season will begin this summer. BCN's Ainsley O'Reilly is at Spitz Stadium with more. Well, Hal, I can barely contain my excitement. The Lethbridge Bulls will be kicking off their season right here at Spitz Stadium on Friday, June 18th against the Oak Tokes Dogs. Fans will be invited to join them, but at a limited capacity. Even more exciting news on Canada Day, a doubleheader against the Edmonton Prospects. They are expecting full capacity in the stands. It's, that's super exciting, you know, it, the, the crowd makes, makes the game so much better and uh, yeah, it's, it's super exciting. The, just being around the team, honestly, it's just, uh, you know, haven't uh, been able to do anything with the guys. So I'm, I'm really excited to just, you know, be around the guys every day and, uh, you know, get to know them, really. I take it uh, cautiously at the beginning and, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully have a few hundred people in the stands to start with. and and you know, just monitor it to make sure that we keep all the protocols and safety measures in place. It's more exciting for the players, you know, it's, uh, um, they've been so isolated in Canada for, for so many months now that just having them to, to go in front of a few hundred people is gonna be thrilling for them. 
For more information on the Bulls' upcoming season, you can always check out their website. This week is National Paramedic Services Week. It's an opportunity to recognize hardworking and courageous professionals for their dedicated public service and to thank them for protecting our health and safety. In this next story, PCN's Naveen Day spoke with a local retired paramedic and heard some unsettling stories. Since the early age of eight, Sharissa Clam knew she wanted to become a paramedic, and her dreams came true in 2008 when she started with Calgary EMS. Now retired from the job, Clam says the work is overwhelming, especially with an overburdened support system. Often there'll be one ambulance available. It's called a red alert in the city of Calgary. So you can imagine the response times can be up to 10 to 15 minutes. The firefighters are usually the first responders to arrive and a lot of them have training in the medical field. However, the fatigue of call to call, barely even getting to eat or have bio breaks, being pushed and pushed and pushed. Clam recommends that if you do see an EMS worker, you should give them a big hug. She says the job is rewarding, but takes a huge mental toll. Post-traumatic stress disorder is not uncommon amongst EMS personnel. The good thing about the job is that you do get to save lives, but however, you also lose lives on the job. And unfortunately, over time, those losses can catch up with the positive saves from too much negativity, starting to forget the goodness in the job that they're doing every day and the saves and they're starting to focus on the negative. Clam adds that suicide among EMS workers is higher than average. This is fresh in her memory following the news of a work colleague who recently died by suicide. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. The City of Calgary will have our province's first drive through vaccination clinic. Health officials say it will be set up in Northeast Calgary beginning in early June. Officials say the new clinic will help increase vaccination rates in the northeast part of the city, which has higher COVID-19 cases, along with targeted clinics for businesses with large workforces in the area. Alberta Health Services is working with the community to finalize a location. A mayoral candidate in Calgary who is alleged to have confronted employees who asked him to put on a mask has been arrested in Edmonton. Police say Kevin Johnston was taken in for causing a disturbance and for being part of an illegal public gathering in contravention of a court order. It's alleged that Johnston entered a number of stores at the Core Shopping Centre downtown Calgary last Saturday without a mask and verbally abused employees who asked him to wear one. He reportedly left the stores and returned with other unmasked patrons who also apparently verbally confronted the employees. Alberta wildlife officials are investigating a death that appears to have been caused by a bear attack northwest of Calgary. Alberta Fish and Wildlife says it was alerted to the fatality Wednesday night on private land southwest of Water Valley. It says officers are still determining the identity of the bear, but a grizzly with a cub was spotted earlier in the area showing aggressive behavior. Officials say traps have been set up but are warning people in the area to take precautions when heading outdoors. Edmonton Oilers General Manager Ken Holland said any racist comments directed toward defenseman Ethan Bear are totally unacceptable and disgusting. Holland says he was told about the issue just before his season-ending address to the media on Wednesday. Bear's girlfriend posted on social media that the defenseman, who's Indigenous, received many racist messages and comments in the aftermath of the Oilers' four-game sweep at the hands of the Winnipeg Jets. The 23-year-old Bear is from a First Nation in southern Saskatchewan. A professor at the University of British Columbia says easing restrictions should also include a plan to provide mental health support for people. Dr. Heidi Torek says resources should be made available to help those who may have phobias about interacting with others after more than a year of keeping their distance. She says communication is vital for health officials to explain and reassure people on why the reopening plan is safe and will work. BC imposed restrictions at the end of March on indoor, restaurant dining and group fitness while reversing a plan to allow indoor faith services as COVID-19 cases continue to climb. A veteran Saskatchewan Mounted charged with murder in the shooting death of a man in a park has resigned from the force. The RCMP says it was in the process of suspending Corporal Bernie Herman of the Prince Albert Detachment when he submitted his resignation late last week. The resignation is effective Tuesday. Herman, who's 53, faces a charge of first-degree murder and the death of 26-year-old Braden Herman. City police said the men knew each other but were not related. 
The Manitoba government announced that all trails are now open in the province's provincial parks after they were closed due to fire and backcountry travel restrictions. The ban was brought in earlier this month due to a lack of moisture in much of the province. Officials reminded campers to use caution when having a campfire and to only use approved fire pits. They say there's also an active wildfire along the western edge of the White Shell Provincial Park, south of Seven Sisters Falls. Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder was on the attack on Wednesday challenging Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on the merits of Bill C-10, which many Canadians feel is an attack on our free speech. Harder says the new legislation takes away choices from many Canadians. Now he wants to put an internet czar in place in order to promote some creators and demo others. It's wrong. With Bill C-10, the Prime Minister is turning Canada into the most digitally regressive democracy in the world. Why? The right honourable Prime Minister. In 2017, the Conservatives demonstrated they didn't understand net neutrality, and uh, they certainly don't understand it now. Uh, Bill C-10 seeks to promote Canadian music, storytelling, and creative works. It does not affect the work and activities of internet service providers in Canada. It has no impact on Canada's commitment to net neutrality. Well, member for Lethbridge. Wow, I thought the Prime Minister was going to mansplain net neutrality there for a moment, but it looks like he doesn't even understand the definition because he couldn't define it. Our country's Auditor General says the Public Health Agency of Canada was not as prepared as it should have been for the pandemic. Karen Hogan says it ignored years of warnings that it was mismanaging a national emergency stockpile of medical supplies. Both audits showed that there were issues in planning and stockpile management before the pandemic. For example... In our audit on procuring personal protective equipment and medical devices, we found that before the pandemic, the Public Health Agency of Canada had not addressed long-standing known issues with the systems and practices used to manage the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile. So if you're asking me today, have they addressed those long-standing issues? The answer would be no. Uh, what we saw them do was work around those issues and shortcomings in order to mobilize a response to support provinces and territories throughout the pandemic. Federal Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller says 75% of Indigenous adults have received a first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. He says many Indigenous communities are ahead of the curve, but there's still areas where there's less uptake, including in areas with a higher youth rate. I think we need to be in a position to offer uh, all Indigenous folks that are eligible for the vaccine um, that choice. And that comes with a lot of information and the choice whether to get vaccinated. Uh, we have clinics that are going on in, in close to 687 communities. So uh, we have a broad deployment and we are, as a comparator, ahead of the curve um, where when we get to, you know, that notional 100 percent, I don't know. Uh, we know that the, the next the next 10 percent is always more difficult than the prior 10 percent just because of um, you know, the law of averages and, and, and the way people behave. So um, it will have to require more tailored efforts, particularly to what we are seeing, which is not hesitancy within the youth population, but perhaps it take a little more time to go and get that second dose. Agriculture is a big part of our economy in Canada, especially here in southwestern Alberta. It is also big in many other parts of the world to help those who are in need during the pandemic. Samaritan's Purse is helping to provide for those in need in Africa. The Christian organization is providing tools, seeds, and training to farmers with disabilities in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're heading to one of our farmer fields to see the progress of their work. This is a group of farmers who are all living with some sort of physical disability and they've been able to come together as a group, learn new techniques and our staff say that this is the best field and farm out of all the other farmers fields. This integrated food security and nutrition project identifies vulnerable and marginalized families, like people living with disabilities, families with malnourished children, and widows who may have access to farming land, but not the tools, seeds, or knowledge they need to improve and diversify their food production. The harvest from these vegetables will provide them with enough food to feed their families, as well as give them an additional source of income. Na, 
anatupatia mimea ya kupanda na wanatuonesa mafunzo yote na mwana kutia mbegu na sisi tunafanya sawa sawa na mbegu inaleta vizuri na kisha tunalima shamba na shamba vile na mwana barisa kutuonesa mapando na tunapanda na mimea inaonesa mzuri sana inaleta vya harita inaweza kukua shukurani makubwa sana makusudi wanatufundisha hii elimu yote isa kuingia kukicho hata wao wakaenda na sisi tunapaki na hii elimu yote shukurani kabandi sana wanaleta kuhu ndani yetu na kuweza kusaidia jamaa yetu it's been incredible to see the impact that this program is having. We have witnessed how just providing training and mentorship, as well as seeds and tools, can really make a difference and transform lives. Great to see the work that Samaritan's Purse is doing in Africa. Zig Ziglar was a World War II veteran. He wrote about over two dozen books and was an incredible Christian motivational trainer and speaker. Sadly, he passed away at the age of 86 in 2012. Author Chris Danham says Ziegler was an incredible mentor to him, which helped inspire his ministry he has today. Mr. Ziegler was God's great salesman. You did not need to know Christ to work for his company, but the odds are by the time you left, you would. Even though he was born in Mississippi and uh, raised in, I mean, lived in Texas, was the most colorblind person I'd ever met. And uh, his only promise to me was, he says, Keep your eye on the prize and I'll show you colorful hope and we'll be off to the races. And before I knew America had problems, I'd made it. Catch the full interview with Jeanette Roche and author Chris Danham, who will discuss his book, Twilight, How One Man Gave Unity in a Verse to My Universe. That's coming up later in our program. Well, we had another gorgeous day here in Lethbridge. It was just a few clouds and it appears as though that more clouds are rolling in, bringing a chance to shower soon. We'll have your complete weather picture for you in just a moment. Yeah, you know, it almost felt like summer today, didn't it? Lots of sunshine and warm air. Jeanette Roche is back with a complete look at the weather picture. Jeanette, it appears as though a low pressure system is returning, however, bringing more clouds and a chance of rain. Yeah, that's right. We are looking at a brief cooling off period uh, into tomorrow and starting in the weekend. But before we start heading back into that much warmer weather by the end of the weekend and into next week when we get into those 20s. So tomorrow, Friday, we're looking at a 30% chance of showers with a risk of an afternoon thunderstorm. Very windy as well tomorrow, 50 to 70 kilometer per hour winds. 16 degrees is our high. Saturday, we're looking at a high of 19 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud, then sunshine on a Sunday with a high of 24. So here's where we're starting to get back into those summertime like temperatures 28 for both Monday and Tuesday and we're looking at a high of 30 degrees for next Wednesday so that will be lovely uh, according to the almanac the average high for this time of year 20 degrees 6 degrees the average low 31 was our high temperature back in 1986 and in 2005 we had our lowest which was minus 2 533 is when the Sun woke up this morning and our sunset this evening on our lovely Thursday night will be 9.25 p.m., so more than 16 hours of daylight, or right around the 16-hour mark. Into the west coast tomorrow, we're looking at 18 degrees, the high for Victoria. Windy in the Wanda Fuca Strait. Sunshine in Vancouver, 16 to the high. We're looking at 5 millimeters of rain, roughly, in Edmonton with a high of 16. 15, the high in Calgary tomorrow, 30% chance of showers and a risk of an afternoon a thunderstorm as well. Those cities looking at wind gusts up to about 40 kilometers per hour. It's going to be a bit windy also in the rest of the prairie. Saskatoon also looking at a chance of thunder showers tomorrow, 22 the high, 19 the high in Regina, a bit windy. These cities looking at wind gusts up to like 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, uh, Winnipeg will be about 20 degrees and sunshine. Toronto though, looking at that temperature there, seven degrees, they are dropping. Chance of showers, sunshine in Ottawa, 14 the high, 15 the high in Montreal with a mix of sun and cloud. Now over on the east coast here, for Fredericton, Halifax, and Charlottetown, all three of those cities looking at a frost advisory in effect for tonight. And so we're gonna look at patches of frost. So if you have um, plants on your balcony or your patio, bring them in. Into tomorrow that we're looking at sunshine. So 17 the high for Fredericton, 15 for Halifax, 12 tomorrow the high in Charlottetown and St. John's Newfoundland sitting at 12 degrees tomorrow with sunny skies. So there you have it. That is your forecast. The chief economist of CIBC says Canada should experience an economic boost as more Canadians are fully vaccinated. Victor Dottage says the U.S. is currently seeing a boom not yet happening in our country, but that it is a tailwind Canada can expect in the second half of this year. 
His remarks came as CIBC reported a second quarter profit of $1.65 billion. That is more than three times higher than a year earlier at the beginning of the pandemic. The bank says adjusted earnings were $3.59 per diluted share, beating analyst expectations by just over 50 cents a share. Suncor Energy has joined oil sands rival Synovus Energy in announcing a carbon emissions target of net zero by the year 2050. That is an upgrade from its previous target in 2015 to reduce emissions by 30 percent by the year 2030. The new target was announced as the company announced a focus on optimizing existing operations while cutting costs and growing low carbon businesses. It says that will allow it to generate $2 billion a year in incremental free flow funds by the year 2025. The revenue will be used to increase dividends, buy back shares and reduce debt. Ford expects 40% of its global sales to be battery electric vehicles by the year 2030 as it adds billions to the amount it is spending to develop them. The automaker says it will add around $8 billion to its EV development spending from this year to 2025. That would bring the total to nearly $20 billion as Ford begins to develop and build batteries in a joint venture with SK Innovation of Korea. American and Chinese trade envoys have talked over the phone for the first time since U.S. President Joe Biden took office. The two sides, however, gave no sign when negotiations on ending their tariff war might restart. Biden has yet to say what approach he is taking to the conflict that was launched when former President Donald Trump raised tariffs on Chinese imports over complaints about Beijing's policy and trade surplus. China retaliated by suspending purchases of U.S. soybeans and raising tariffs on other goods. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 28 points on the day to finish at 19,774. The Dow was up 141 points to 34,465. The S&P 500 was up 4 points to 4201. And the Nasdaq was down 1 point to 13,736. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 65 cents to 66.86 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 6 cents to 296 US. Gold was up 7 cents to 1896.61 US an ounce. And silver was up a cent to 27.85 US an ounce. Wheat is at $338 per metric ton. Barley's at $344. Canola November future contract is $711. And corn is at $403 per metric ton. Live cattle were down 10 cents to 116.35. Feeder cattle were down 20 cents to 136.30. And lean hogs were up 45 cents to 115.73. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 82.86 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, an Alberta infectious disease specialist says she has some concerns about the province's three-stage reopening plan. Dr. Lenora Saxinger from the University of Alberta says there's little data to draw from on potential effects of resuming large public gatherings. She also points out that vaccination uptake in the province is patchy at best. The province's open for summer plan allows for places of worship to go back to 15% capacity beginning Friday. Also, hair salons and restaurant patios will reopen on Tuesday, and all restriction orders will be scrapped in time for the Calgary Stampede in July. The open for summer plan by the UCP government has been a hot-button topic at the legislature. Coming up next, our legislative reporter Tyler Dawson has more detail of what it will take to fully reopen Alberta by July. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney recently announced the province's reopening plans. To discuss this in more detail is our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Tyler, it looks like as long as COVID-19 hospitalization rates remain low and more Albertans are vaccinated against the virus, we should be fully open by, what, July? Yeah, that's the target the government is aiming for. Premier Jason Kenney promised on Wednesday, basically, that Stampede's going to go ahead, that we are going to, you know, have a summer that everything's going to be great. So it's a it's a three-stage plan. The first stage begins basically Friday, actually, with, with limits on the number of people who are allowed in church services going up to 15% of fire code occupancy. And then Monday is when it really gets rolling with, you know, outdoor patios being reopened and things like that. Um, and then, it, it, as you mentioned, it's all sort of contingent on vaccination numbers and hospitalization. So, so phase one is pinned at 50%. Of uh, eligible people getting the first dose of their vaccine, which we cleared that on May 18th, I think. Um, and then the second one, the second phase is 60%, and the third one is 70%. So 
things are coming along nicely on the vaccination front. Um, and we'll just have to keep an eye on those hospitalization numbers to make sure they're still uh, still coming down. And I noticed in social media too, people planning for weddings. That's good news for wedding parties as well. If they're having their wedding in August or September, there shouldn't be much of an issue, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, there's always the risk something could go wrong, of course. Premier, former Premier Rachel Notley, I should say, uh, raised some concerns in the legislature that this was going to be moving too fast, that it might put us at risk of a fourth wave. Now, the government, of course, responding by saying that, look, we've looked at the data in other countries, in Israel, the United Kingdom. Uh, this is based on the science and things like that. So, so it, it is a faster opening plan, I think it's fair to say, than other provinces. Um, but the government seems pretty uh, pretty sure they've got the science right on this one. And so many small business owners are more than happy and more excited. And I'm really excited to give them their business as well, to see them reopened. Tyler, the province has ordered the suspension of research links to China. The University of Lethbridge here, the U of C, the U of A and Athabasca University must all report to the province within 90 days their ties to the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese government. Tyler, let me ask you something. What ties would an Alberta university have with China? Yeah, this seems to be in sort of research partnerships, whether it's a partnership with a, a firm in China or other universities in China. The government sort of wants to know whether or not there are any, um, not national security implications necessarily, but whether or not there, there's the risk of theft of technology, of research, of uh, things being developed um, by sort of the Chinese government or the Communist Party. Um, so, you know, there are lots of partnerships going back uh, quite some time between universities and other Chinese universities and research institutes. So the, the universities have said they're going to do this. They'll look into it and, and report back. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in regards to some of these older relationships that exist. You know, the Li Keqing Institute at the University of Alberta, a big institute that's been involved in the fight against COVID-19, with research and things like that, you know, that's funded by a, an entrepreneur in Hong Kong, which is, you know, up, up until, you know, recently uh, was independent, but now really more and more part of China. So it, it, it's perhaps going to have some interesting implications for universities in uh, the weeks and months and years to come. I think I believe I heard as well from Minister Nicolaitis who was talking about the theft of intellectual property. That was a big concern as well. We all know what happened with Nortel way back when. So I can see why the, the government is really concerned about that. Alberta teachers recently passed a vote of non-confidence regarding Education Minister Adriana Lagrange. Tyler, does this really hold any weight or is this, as the government says, just the union may be playing politics? Yeah, it really doesn't mean much of anything, you know, for, for better or for worse, I suppose. We saw this happen last summer, actually, with Health Minister Tyler Shandro. The doctors had sort of done a similar thing. But it was the, the Alberta Teachers Association convention over the weekend. So they talked about all sorts of things, including the draft curriculum. And um, and they took this vote on, on LaGrange. And something like 99% of teachers uh, said they didn't have confidence in her. So, of course, the New Democrats picking up on this, using it as a bit of a, a club against the United Conservatives. But they're saying, no, this is playing politics with our kids' future. Um, you know, this isn't a non-confidence vote uh, that, you know, topples a government or something. They're just saying, no, we don't, we don't like the education minister very much and would perhaps like her to leave. You know, let's talk about that new draft curriculum as well, which you said many teachers have rejected. But some Indigenous groups have also said that they felt betrayed after seeing more of the draft. Can you explain why? This is a really interesting one. So whenever criticism of the curriculum has come up, the United Conservatives have said they pointed to a handful of people who, they, who they've said have endorsed this curriculum. Now, there's a story this week that basically talked to these people and asked them, you know, what their views were and whether or not they did, in fact, endorse it. And so there's sort of two things that happened there. The first is a couple people said that, look, we saw a summary of the curriculum and it sounded great. And so we endorsed that. And then a couple other people said, well, we received hundreds of pages of documents pertaining to the curriculum and had a day or two to um, respond. And so basically what they're saying is, you know, our, our endorsement of this is, is not really based on, you know, a full knowledge of the curriculum. And um, they, they said they feel like they're being tokenized by the government, um, you know, being used to defend it. So a bit of an awkward situation the government's finding itself in. Of course, they, they are now pointing to the fact that this is a draft curriculum. This isn't the final curriculum. 
It's being piloted in a couple schools this fall, but um, still time for consultation, still time for modification, of course. Tyler, the anti-Albert Energy Inquiry has received yet another extension for filing its final report. This is what, the fourth extension since it was originally due last July? Why the delays? It, it's really hard to say at this point. I mean, the energy inquiry is it's very secretive in a lot of ways. You know, it's not covered by freedom of information requests that journalists often use to get information from government bodies. Steve Allen, the commissioner behind it, has not said very much. Um, I believe they've they've sort of cited COVID as a reason for a delay over the course of the pandemic. But yeah, as you say, this is the fourth delay. Um, you know, this this was such a big ticket item in the early days of the Kenny premiership that it's um, obviously fallen to the side during the pandemic, but it's been odd, I guess, to see the government sort of allowing it to keep getting pushed back because I think at least at this point, surely they want a win. And um, this might end up being that for them. This might be the sort of thing that helps fill the, fill the sails a little bit of uh, some of their supporters. Um, but on that front, there is a, a teeny tiny nugget of good news, which is that EcoJustice, the environmental uh, law group, basically, had gone to court to try and shut down the inquiry, saying it, you know, it was brought in, in in bad faith and and was you know attacking charitable organizations, intimidating them, um, and tried to get it shut down, and and it got tossed out of court. Um, so, you know, there's there's a little bit of a, a clearer path forward for the inquiry. At this point, at least, it's, uh, uh, it's just a question of when they're actually going to finish their work. You know, has the province found much proof as to the anti-Alberta energy sentiment that's out there by special interest groups? Yeah, well, and that's hard to say, of course, because the government's been sort of repeating the claims made by Vivian Krauss, a researcher, for a couple years. And that sort of formed part of the basis of this inquiry. Um, and the government's been obviously saying this for a long time and citing some of that research. And so you have sort of two things happening, of course. On, on one hand, you could point to Krauss's research and say, we already know all of this, so why are we doing this again? Or you could say, secondly, Krauss's research maybe wasn't that good. We don't like her research, so why are we doing this? Um, so it's a weird scenario all, all around, I would say, and the government has bits and pieces of evidence. Um, but of course, I think they're looking for this sort of grand conspiracy narrative, which is obviously a little bit harder to dig up. Tyler, the NDP is pushing for paid sick leave. Now, when the legislature resumed, NDP leader Rachel Notley and company tried to get an emergency de debate on the subject, but it was promptly shot down by the UCP? Yeah, that happened on Tuesday. So, of course, the NDP is really pushing this paid sick leave thing, you know, even as we're sort of on our way out of the pandemic. Um, and, and the UCP has been really reluctant and resistant to do it. Of course, we saw this debate play out in British Columbia and in Ontario as well. And so the NDP clearly thinks that they uh, can make some, some political uh, ground up on that. Um, UCP hasn't done it. Um, you know, Kenny has referred to it as a jobs killing policy. Rachel Notley responded basically by saying that this is a this is a life saving policy, not a job killing policy. It came up in question period on Wednesday a little bit, so it's you know one of those issues that I, I don't think anything's going to happen on. Um, you know, unless for some reason we get hit by a horrible fourth wave, I I, I don't think we're going to see movement on it. But for the new Democrats, it's it's clearly a good um, political move to keep bringing it up. The province reintroduced its turn off the taps bill, Tyler. Now, the original had a sunset clause and it expired. And this one apparently excludes gas and does not have an expiry date. Energy Minister Sonia Savage says, what, this is another way we can protect our resources? Yeah, I, I admit I was caught off guard when that was introduced this week because I was like, we already have this. So so what's going on here? But but that's basically the gist of it. You know, they they are reintroducing it because it expired. And it's, it's broadly similar other than a, a sort of an exclusion for refined, refined petroleum products, so gasoline, basically. But, um, you know, we'll see if it ever gets used, of course, because it hasn't been used. But that tool is uh, sitting in the toolbox. Yeah, because the, uh, the Transmont pipeline expansion, you know, having to go through BC, BC back down. So I think that's originally why they wanted to bring it forth, right, as maybe a threat at that point in time. Tyler, an Alberta MP, got into a little bit of trouble recently and was threatened with being kicked out of the House of Commons. His offense? Wearing an I love oil and gas button, and that's against the rules on the Hill. 
Yeah, so, you know, not specifically an Alberta legislature story, but I, I do try to keep my eye out for, you know, fun stuff happening in the world of Canadian politics. And that's right, Martin Shields, uh, I believe the MP from down your way, um, had a I love Canadian oil and gas button on his lapel there. And the specific rule in the House of Commons is that you're not allowed to have props. So you can't have signs or anything like that. Um, and it's come up a few times in the past. Reform Party MPs apparently used to bring little Canadian flags for their desks and were told they couldn't do that. So, you know, he took the pin off, the button off at the end of the day, and it, it didn't end up being an issue, but um, did, did cause, you know, minor controversy with uh, some some other MPs saying that they have pins that they might like to wear as well, but it's against the rules and so on and so forth. So off the pin came and he was allowed to stay in the house. That's bizarre, though, how you can't have a Canadian flag on your desk at the Canadian House of Parliament. Like, what? <laughs> you can't have a Canadian flag. It's very strange, that's true. It is, yeah, it's kind of odd. Our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Al. For any of us who are struggling or discouraged, sometimes it's helpful to hear a good rags to riches story or a story where the unlikely person makes it work out. Today's guest has a great story to share with us. We are joined by Chris Denham. He is a highly successful businessman and motivational speaker, founder of Mala Ministries and author of Twilight, How One Man gave unity in a verse to my universe. That's quite a title. Welcome to Bridge City News, Chris. So great to have you on today. Uh, thank you so much for having me, it's a joy. Of course, so you have a fascinating story. Can you share a bit of your journey and how you ended up coming to America from India? Well, of course, you know, growing up in India, one of the aspirations was to get out somewhere and make it. India is quite different now than it was when I was coming up. There were very few opportunities. And so the West was typically the site one would pick. Uh, I ended up going to business school in India and there met and fell in love with a girl who was born in the US but raised in India. So she grew up in India. It was the opposite case. She came back to India when she was two years old. So I told her about my desire to come to America. She says, well, why don't we both go? And uh, she came over in 1984, brought me over in 1986. So that's the Reader's Digest version of God's great divine plan. <laughs> now, Chris, you had an encounter with legendary motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar. So what happened? Well, uh, I won a sales contest in 1990. I can think, yeah, late 1989. And the winning prize for the sales contest was a ticket to Mr. Ziegler's seminar in Dallas in uh, 1990 on January 26th. I remember the date. And I went into that, uh, I went into that seminar uh, looking for hope like anybody else was trying to scrape and make a living. And even though I had academic qualifications in three hours, this very simple man, uh, profound, changed my world completely. I left a very determined young man. I, one determination was to somehow find a way to go work for him. And even though I was a branch manager for a company, I quit my job and went to work for him as a telemarketer because that's the only position he had. And uh, the rest was history. We had a union of 17 years and I crisscrossed the globe with him, wrote a book with him, yeah. That's amazing. Now, through that, you became to have a have a faith in Christ. How, maybe tell us how this happened and what impact this made on your life. Yeah, in, a, in another book called Abstracts to Absolutes, I talk about the fact that Mr. Ziegler was God's great salesman. You did not need to know Christ to work for his company, but the odds are by the time you left, you would. And uh, I was raised an Orthodox Hindu. I grew up in a family that has high priests. I came from that background. And my wife, even though she was a believer, wanted to make sure that my choice in God and my choice in faith would be of my own doing. So my parents would not accuse her of something or would not blame the West or some other thing. So Mr. Ziegler just would casually converse with me and he would offer me everything. But I rejected the faith he was offering. I was happy with the faith of my ancestors. But when my son was born, I invited Mr. Ziegler to come to my son's baptism because my wife said she was going to raise my boy in the faith. And uh, when I asked Mr. Ziegler to come, he said he would if I asked if I answered one question. And that was simply, why do you want to send your boy to someplace you're not sure you're going? And immediately my world did not need a theological understanding for God. He presented a present continuous situation 
where maybe there may be a place where I'll never be separated from the love of my loved ones. So I had the rare privilege of being baptized with my son, with Mr. Ziegler in attendance. Oh my gosh, that is so beautiful. So you started out as a tele, a, a telemarketer with him. Where did that grow to? What, how, yeah, I'm just so curious. Well, you know, yeah, you, uh, one of the things is, you know, he, in one of his books, talked about the immigrant attitude. He says immigrants, when they flip burgers, don't think of flipping burgers. They think of owning the franchise. So that's just how we are. And uh, when I went to work for him as a telemarketer, I had already set my sight on which office I wanted. And I knew it would be a long haul, but I already knew that I would do something different. Now, the one thing that nobody was doing at that time was making a sacrifice because everybody was about demand. I demand this. I went up to them and offered them a proposition. I said, I'll do two jobs for the price of one. And the one job I want that I'll do for free is the job of traveling with him. So they eliminated the position of the person who they were paying who was traveling with him. And I made them a condition. I basically said that if at any time I don't hit my goal on either one of them, fire me from both. And after about six months of doing both jobs, they said, you're more well served serving him. Why don't you just travel with him and bring business from the road? And I was off to the races. And before I, I mean, I'm not kidding you. Within about a year, I was director of international operations. Within about five, I was vice president of global operations. So. Oh, my gosh. And you've probably been to every country in the world at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Every country that, I mean, every continent that has people, the moment Antarctica opens up for seminars and the penguins come, I'll go there too. But, <laughs> but yeah, 75 countries, uh, I've been very fortunate. God has allowed me to proclaim his word as an evangelist. I started a foundation, so I work in sub-Saharan Africa with the Maasai tribe. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I've had unique opportunities all over the world, but uh, all owed to that man who basically even though he was born in Mississippi and uh, raised in, I mean, lived in Texas, was the most colorblind person I'd ever met. And uh, his only promise to me was, he says, keep your eye on the prize and I'll show you colorful hope and we'll be off to the races. And before I knew America had problems, I'd made it. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, what does our character have to do with success in life? You gave us a pretty good example there. Yeah, see, character is the ability to have pride in the mundane. The mundane is what we do every day. And an inbuilt, determined character that comes from faith where you have dignity in labor, dignity in provision, dignity in providing, you don't care what you do as long as you get to do something. And sitting idle is not just something that either lends itself to my immigrant roots or lends itself to my faith roots. So I tell people, I mean, my, my model for success in life has been the book of Acts. I said, always have a Paul to look up to, model his character. Always have a Timothy to leave it to, make sure you have a succession plan. And always have a Barnabas to encourage you, make sure that you're not defeated. I said, that's God's holy trifecta and you cannot lose. That's amazing. That kind of sums up your life right there too, doesn't it? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Now, in your book, you write that racism, prejudice, and bigotry have soiled the hearts of men and that this is actually blasphemy towards God. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure, because, I mean, we God does not see color. And in fact, I was listening to a message by R.C. Sproul yesterday when he talked about the fact that if you ask anybody and you hold up an orange and say, what color is this? They'll say orange. But technically, every object is either black or white. It is the light reflecting of the prism of our lens and the pigmentation that dances on that, that coordinate to give it. So God in his creation created color so that man would enjoy the beauty of it. And uh, we demean God when we limit our abilities to what we see as pigmentation on skin or prejudice in terms of our heart. Now, prejudice is natural. But sometimes we do, we hijack the word to mean other things. If I told people I'm prejudicial towards my bride over anybody else's wife, I'm considered a very good husband. But the word prejudice means a preference for, that's all it is. And we are prejudiced in many different ways. We have preference for our boundaries. We have preference for our family. But I think God's boundary does not include the boundary of color. And that's why Martin Luther King himself said, you know, he says, I refuse to believe that man is bound by the starlit uh, 
scourge of racism. When he talked about a dream, he talked about a dream that was colorblind. And, uh, but you know, going back to your earlier question, it was based on character. And I think unless people go back to the nobility of God's character, we'll continue to see color that our eyes want us to see and not what God wants us to see. Mm -hmm. We live in a time where many people seem to be pushing division rather than unity, don't we? And so how can we avoid doing this and what can we do to reverse this destructive trend? And you mentioned the key words, unity and diversity. When you look at the word university, that's what it stood for, unity and diversity. But right now our universities are so one-sided in what they want to offer you. It is no longer the halls of academia and rhetoric that came out of Greece. It is just a cesspool of ignorance. In fact, yesterday I put, you know, I said, ignorance is not a medal. People should stop wearing it. And if some of the stupid ideas in this world were good, we'd have found out a way to tax ignorance. There's a right and a wrong, a yes and a no, a black and a white, and all of this goes back to God's moral law. When humanity moved away from a moral law, they moved away from a moral law giver. When they started seeking justice, they wanted human beings to make the decision. And even the great Solomon failed at that. So we need to realize that uh, what we are sowing in our hearts right now in trying to educate people on diversity while it started off as a sensible thing to do, it is actually causing more division because we are now clumping people and people are only seeing themselves in terms of their identity. And uh, in my book, Twilight, I articulate seven different times when I thought I was marginalized because of my color, my accent, my origin, my roots, my ethnicity. And seven different times he says, no, God does not see you this way. And I'm not going to let you see yourself that way. That's incredible. Now, in your writings, you also suggest that no one on earth has a monopoly on grief, misery, or hardship. So how does staying in a place of victimhood destroy our future success? When someone victimizes you one time and you remember the victimization, the present is where you set goals for the future. By feeling a victim about something that happened in your past and feeling that victimization in the present, you arrive in the future less equipped than all of the competition. So if someone messed you up one time, you're paying the price three times. That's not fair. So what you do is find out who victimized you, find out what they did, find out whatever happened. And uh, if you need professional help, get that. But 99% of the time, just write them a barn burner of a letter and then burn it. Either forget what people did to you if you can, but greater yet is what Christian doctrine allows me, forgive them. Not once, but 70 times seven. The more you forgive someone, the less victimized you'll feel. Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> oh my gosh. I like that barn burner, barn burner of a letter you talked about, meaning you can say what you're going to say, but then don't ever let them read it, right? <laughs> it just, yeah. it just and, feels good to get it off your chest. I mean, you know, they said confession is good for the soul, but, uh, you know, apparently it looks like now we have social media for that. Everybody's an expert on everything. I tell people, I said, if you want to confess and grieve, don't use faceless book. Try to read the good book. I said, I said the reason is most people on Facebook are hiding from their real face and none of them have read a book. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so Krish, what, what is the greatest lesson that you learned from your friendship with Zig Ziglar? He was so influential in your life. Yeah, Mr. Ziglar was uh, the most consistent man I'd ever met. And uh, what I heard from him on day one and what I heard from him on year 17 was the same, consistency. He talked about a God he would meet, who he would thank for every affiliation he ever had. I mean, 48 hours before he died, I was allowed to be in the room with him for an hour. And three times he opened his eyes from that fog of Alzheimer's and looked at me and said three times, thank you, Lord, for this boy, my legacy. And uh, that's he was just he was a way ahead of his time. I mean, what are the odds that a man who was as successful as he was nine books on bestseller list, 30 book author commanding huge speaking fees? would put his arm around a lowly immigrant like me and say, 
let's not worry about where I came from. Let's always worry about where I can take you. I mean, that, he, was a, he was a mentor's mentor, and uh, I owe everything I am. In fact, my training center is called the Ziegler Summit. Um, everything pretty much, yeah, he made me who I am. That's awesome. Looks like we are almost out of time, but Krish, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate having you on and sharing your story. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, look forward to catching up somewhere down the road. Krish Denham is the author of Twilight, How One Man Gave Unity in a Verse to My Universe. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.